welcome to Stockholm Design Talks. Uh, the overall theme that we're going to discuss today is the success story. How do you build a successful brand today, be it in publishing or, or in design? Uh, my name is Anna Nova Beatrice. I'm a design writer and editor-in-chief of a Swedish title called Residence. And my residence, which is our English title, and with me today, I have a great panel, uh, and I thought we could start with them introducing themselves. Um, do you want to start, Marcus? Sure. Hi, I'm uh, Marcus Engman, and I work as head of design at IKEA since four years back. I'm Nathan Williams. I'm the founder and creative director of Our Media. Uh, we're based in Copenhagen now, uh, and we're both a publisher and an agency. Uh, we mostly do both print and digital media, specifically for a young creative audience. Uh, and the main title that we distribute is uh, Kinfolk Magazine. And I'm uh, Jonas Bjerg Poulsen. I'm uh, one of the partners in Norm Architects, a Danish architectural firm. Uh, I have a background in city planning and architectural philosophy, but I've been working with industrial design for the past 15 years since I started studying more or less. Um, today I work with residential architecture, uh, commercial, uh, interior architecture, industrial design in a lot of different scales and creative art directions for a number of companies. And for the past three years I've spent a lot of my hours um, working for the Danish design brand uh, menu where we've been through a, a rebranding uh, process, taking them from like a mainstream accessories brand into a full-blown lifestyle brand. I'm Lotta Agathon. I'm an interior stylist and I'm, I'm freelancing. I, I'm based in Stockholm, but I work global. Thank you. Uh, I want to start with directing the first question to you, Nathan. Um, you started, you founded Kinfolk um, all, when you still were studying, right? Mm -hmm. And then you went on to do uh, work with banking before um, deciding to focus full-time on Kinfolk. Uh, and, this, and it reached a success very quickly and reached very broad very quickly. And this in a time when they say print is dead. Uh, what, what were the key factors that, that you reach out so quick globally? I hope print isn't dead because that's your industry as well. We'd both be out of a job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, we started working on it about five years ago. And I think when we launched the title, it was very strategic, like it was to fill a gap on the newsstand. Um, we wanted to create a magazine that was, yeah, that could explore the idea of quality of life for, for a younger generation of, you know, people in their 20s and 30s. Um, and in doing so, we were very uh, explicit with the purpose that we had, that we wanted to, you know, talk about the ideas of, of community and slowing down. and. I think crucial to the success was that clarity of our purpose. Like we knew, we knew why we were doing it, we knew what we wanted to accomplish with it, and we made that very clear to the readers. And I mean, I think not just with magazines, but with, with designers, with products, with any brand, if, if you're clear about the purpose and if it's something that resonates mm -hmm. with the consumer, then it's, it's easy for them to latch onto it. Uh, it's a way for them to, I don't know, use it as like a marker for for what they value and care about. So, I mean, that really helped us in the beginning, I think. But did you, you had a very strong uh, visual identity from the start. Mm -hmm. Were you very clear with that from the beginning? And have you kept that same visual identity since then? It, I mean, it was very specific when we started. Um, it, was, it, it was natural and kind of easy in the beginning because we were such a small team that it it is like a singular vision when there's just yeah. a few people working on it. Um, but now that there's more of us, we have, I mean, we have very detailed style guides and, um, I mean, Jonas, you've seen them before. Yeah. You know, I did some <laughs> photography for Kinfolk some years back and it was a brief this long. <laughs> and we and scared, was, scared you know, them away. Everything from colors to lighting to position of objects and everything was just, uh, I only had to press a button and <laughs> it was... Uh, but I mean, there is, there's, there's a reason that we do that. Yeah. Um, and it's, there's some magazines that have that approach. There's others that, um, that are more, more of an, an, an anthology, a collection of other people's work. Um, but for us, it's important that, you know, image after image that our readers see, over time, they, they recognize a certain look, that they can tell that it's, it's a kinfolk image. Um, in a way, it's like, 
like when you meet a new friend, uh, you know, their face is kind of foreign, like you don't totally know them, but then after like 50 coffees, you, you're familiar, and you're not just familiar, but you get comfort every time that you see them. Not, not 50 coffees at the same time, but like <laughs> <laughs> over time. Yeah. Over time. Uh, that's what we're trying to do with kinfolk. Like by seeing a kinfolk image or a kinfolk spread, you recognize it and you enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah, because it's really, today I think uh, the majority of, of people working in the design industry, they know the idea of the kinfolk image. But could that also be limiting or is it just, uh, can you get stuck in that or do you feel you can still be creative within that strong visual identity? It's, I mean, it's, it is limiting, um, but I think it's, it's a healthy, it's a healthy restriction. Uh, for us, it's always keeping, keeping one hand on that, those guidelines, but then experimenting and having fun with it. And also allowing our contributors um, to have some fun with it as well. <laughs> uh, Jonas, you're one of the founders of Norm Architects. And as you mentioned earlier, uh, you've also been involved in the rebranding with uh, Menu. Do you want to tell us a bit about that journey? Because it's gone quite quick. Yeah, it, it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> working double full time for three years, it's been a long, long journey, I think, and filled with uh, with challenges. I think um, one of the biggest challenge was actually to get people to understand our vision from the beginning on. I mean, we uh, we did like a, a manifest for where we wanted to go aesthetically. I, like Nathan, I think we had a very clear vision, building on on the aesthetic approach, um, the design approach we had in all architects already, for where we wanted to go. And and uh, and then I launched like a almost a political campaign within the company called a new way. <laughs> so we're inspired by almost like American presidential campaigns, <laughs> and uh, everything just had to change. I think to make it work because I was looking at other kind of like business cases with companies that tried to reposition them in a market upwards and I could actually find very, very few cases. So for several months I just keep, kept asking people, could you tell me about any case within some business that actually managed to rebrand themselves and position them differently or higher up in the market? It's easy to trickle down once you yeah. start at the top, um, I came up with, I think H&M did a good uh, job actually, uh, Skoda uh, in the car industry, uh, relatively successful and so on. But, but that was kind of hard, so I knew I ha we had to change a lot very quickly. Um, and with this a New Way campaign, I started approaching uh, designers uh, here in Stockholm, in Milan, in New York. Uh, <coughs> but I only had a presentation in words, more or less. And I told them that we wanted to do sofas and lighting and, you know, a lot of the designers were pretty reluctant uh, to meet at first uh, because we didn't have so much to come with. Uh, but I persuaded most of them and we sat down and after a while they kind of understood our vision, I thought. Uh, but when I get all, got all the, the design ideas from them, most of them said, well, I know you briefed me on a sofa, or I know you wanted a lamp, but I've been looking at many website, and I think this coffee cup is better for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was really uphill. Yeah. So we had to kind of change the whole strategy around building the brand, and I had to go around to colleagues that I'd known had done pieces for exhibitions, or something that hadn't gone into production, or working with very young designers, uh, or even students, and try to curate a collection almost like going to the flea market and finding things and putting them together, which was not at all what we intended to begin with. Um, and we had the same problems internally at the company, you know, you know the people just didn't understand why we needed to change uh, and where we were going with suppliers. Uh, we came down and said, well, we have this great design on a sofa, and they said, oh, it's really nice. And after a while, they sent us an email, well, we've been visiting your website and we can see you only sell coffee cups. So I don't think we yeah. can produce your sofa, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, it's been a lot of challenges like that. And, uh, and we ended up doing a lot of the, our, the things ourselves to begin with, just to show the vision physically as fast as we could. Mm. And that was why speed was pretty cru crucial to make it work to, yeah. in order to succeed. Marcus, you, you've been in your current role at IKEA for four years. 
but you've lived with the company since you were very young and had many different roles at, uh, in the company. It's been happening a lot at IKEA lately um, and we gave you the prize, our re residence form prize for the producer of the year. Uh, last year uh, for your amazing work uh, with Ilse Crawford, among others. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit how it was, uh, what your vision was when you came back to the company four years ago? I, you know, what, working with design within IKEA, it's not a me thing, it's a we thing. And I think that's the big thing, coming back to IKEA also, and to make that happen again. So the first thing that we set out to do was actually to um, maybe have a common ground for how to evaluate what's good design within the company, to make some kind of tool for that. And then we set the tool which we call democratic design, which is like the starting point for almost everything in uh, what we do at IKEA, both for architecture and uh, actually for product design at the same time. So um, that was the first part. And then um, I'm not very fond of strategies and paperwork and that stuff, so I'm more like a lead by example kind of guy. So that's why we started off with working with those collections, because what we could see was that we're kind of we were pretty good at IKEA, always been and pretty successful. But maybe we needed to take in bigger learnings from the outside world. So this thing about doing collections with people is not like a marketing thing. It's actually about learnings. So bringing in Ilse Crawford is about learning about her views upon tactility and everything. Mm. Other collections like we have done with the um, fashion industry. Yeah, you were talking about speed. Yeah. I think that's pretty important for the future mm -hmm. and to be closer to the market all the time mm. and closer to the needs of people, which is changing really, really rapidly. So um, it's about learnings. Mm. So and working with leading by example and doing it together, I think that's the, the key. Mm. But to be able to do that, you have to have this common ground as you were talking about. And for me, I think you could have two different approaches on this. You could have like a steering tools or guidelines, which is saying what you shouldn't do or you could encourage people to do something better. So those tools are more about putting up the right kind of questions. Mm. Then you find your answers instead of saying this is the way. So, what has been the main challenges uh, or the, the, the biggest challenge? Has it been within the company to communicate a, a culture or a change like Jonas was mentioning or has it been something else? We have a pretty strong culture within IKEA, and, and that's something that we're proud of. I would say that the biggest challenge for me coming back personally was that when I left the company 12 years ago, it was a big company. Coming back, it was twice as big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a little bit scary, and it was like harder than I thought, actually, with this big thing, big gigantic tanker. Uh, then I think that it was... Um, this scale of things is not just about moving people, it's also about moving things. Mm. You know, when we bring in a new product, to, uh, this is something that most people don't really think of. But when we set out to do a new product, we most often have to like, invest in a new factory. So when you design a product, you design a factory, mm. which like the scale of things is gigantic. And that's, mm. of course, something to learn. Wow. Lotta, you have uh, worked as a stylist for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we've collaborated much together at my magazine as well, but you also work a lot with the, with the different companies all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel your, your role has changed? Because if we talk about success, uh, it's also about communicating the design and reaching out with the picture. Mm -hmm. ha, has, have your clients changed and, and the way uh, their expectations on you? Yeah, I think the profession has changed a lot. When I started out 15 years ago, you counted. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, being a stylist, the profession hardly existed. There were, in Sweden, there were like maybe five or six of us and everyone was working at magazines. And I don't even think we were called stylists. I think we were like interior decorators or something. But, but then there wasn't really a need for images apart from in the magazines since, I mean, it's, it sounds strange today, but 15 years ago, internet hardly existed. And I mean, the brands that's represented here today, I don't think anyone had a website. So there wasn't really a need for images and there wasn't really a need for a stylist. So yes, it has changed a lot. But when, when did you start to feel this change? I think it was maybe like five or six years ago with the social medias and with the websites and uh, when people started to realize that you have to create 
something to stand out in this buzz of images that we are exposed to every day. And can you feel it, uh, that it's getting even more? That yeah, it does. Yeah. It does. And I think the big change when this blog hype came a couple of years ago, it was uh, all about creating a lot of images. And I hope and I feel that it's getting more into quality now. Like for me as a stylist, I always, I mean, the first thing we do is I have to understand the DNA of the company. What are we doing? What are we selling? It's, it's not just about making nice anymore. It's about branding. Mm. So when the clients come to you, it's, it's almost like it's the, the final step of uh, finalizing a collection. Yeah. What, yeah. what, what is it? Uh, how do you work with them? Well, At what stage do you get in? It's very different. If, I mean, for the big companies like IKEA, you have, <laughs> uh, they have an ad agency, and then it's normally, normally I get a brief, but I have a saying and we sit down together. But then when I work with smaller companies and direct with companies, then we do the brief together. And, and to me, it's all about understanding the company. It's, and I think that's a big, big misunderstanding. Like, being a stylist today, it's not about showing off, it's not about showing how good I am, it's about showing the company, you know, expressing what they want to express. Mm -hmm. And that's what's fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if, uh, if, if we talk about product versus image, is it not uh, enough today uh, to create a good product? If you are a design brand, do you also need to have a really good image? Uh, what's your view on this, Jonas? Because you've also worked a lot with photography. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's very strong when there's like a one-to-one -one coherence between product and image. But I would say that product in, in many ways is king because, I mean, if you have a really good product, people will also find out in many ways. But of course, you can really destroy a good product producing bad images. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, to a certain extent, you can also sell a pretty bad product if you have great images. <laughs> uh, so there's somewhere in between. Um, but but uh, yeah, I think it's it's for for companies that really experience success. I think there's a very clear like one-to-one -one connection between product price level, consumers, uh, image style, uh, distribution, and so on. And as soon as there's kind of like a a disruption between those different joints on the road, they experience trouble or they don't reach the level they could have reached. Uh, yeah. Mm. Do you work a lot around the image as well at IKEA or the photograph? <laughs> What's, uh... Of course we do, since like lots of years. Yeah. You know, we were kind of famous for the catalog. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, we do, but I, um, we more talk, we don't talk about actually when we do the products or go into new products, we uh, start off with a story. And that's kind of a new thing. We you know, mm -hmm. let the communication steer also. Of course, it's people's needs, but then what's the story? What's the change that we want to achieve with this? And if you're clear about that, then you have like, the idea for the product mm -hmm. and also how to, mm -hmm. how to get it out through communication and, and pictures uh, along the way. Then, it's, as you say, it's not a big problem. Mm -hmm. But if you start off with just like product development without the clear purpose or a clear story to it, then it's much harder. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I think that's us to a m bigger and bigger degree, we start off with, you know, what's, what's the vision and try to visualize where we want to go mm -hmm. before starting. Mm -hmm. so, Nathan, how, how important is, has your visual identity been in social media and has that been really important for you in your success? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's just been part of can you direct it? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's been part of what we do, absolutely. But it is interesting hearing, I mean, how it's changed your career, but also, I mean, the, the need for images, the need for websites, it's, it's created a whole industry, mm -hmm. and it's, it's revived an industry that, that we work in. I mean, yourself and me. Um, we work with a lot, of, a lot of companies that come to us wanting help with, with imagery, with campaigns, with websites. Um, they're also much more keen to, to work with us for advertising and, and putting products in the magazine because we all know that that's, it's very important. Mm -hmm. The audience that they're trying to reach, uh, they have an appetite for it. They want to see the images and brands are understanding that that's not something that they can, can skip. It's not an mm -hmm. option. Mm -hmm. uh, Is, isn't there a change in the roles also in between like uh, art directors and stylists that you could see? 
Yeah, it is. It's, it's melting together. Yeah. And, and I think the biggest change is between the photographer and the stylist. Because mm -hmm. when I was started, I was kind of the assistant to the photographer. And these days, I always get, well, most of the time, I get the work and then I get to choose the photographer. So that has really been the big change. Mm -hmm. right. and, and also, I think being an art director today, you have a lot of clients. You can do mustard one day and banks the other day. And interior and fashion has become so specific, so you need to be like a team. They need someone from the inside the industry to help them out. It's, so that, that has changed. But I also think that having a very strong identity in your work like you have and, mm -hmm. and kinfolk, people buy into a universe. Mm -hmm. They buy into your style. Yeah. I mean, instead of just finding some stylists that can do a certain job yeah. or fulfill their vision. Yeah. Yeah. That's also maybe different That's true. from... But it's also a responsibility because yeah, yeah. all my clients are competitors and uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I have to handle that. I can't do the same thing for my clients, then I wouldn't get any more jobs. So I have to constantly, you, should you know, just create, renew. just create fake names that you work yeah, exactly. on there. Exactly. <laughs> different websites. Yeah. No, but you have to develop all the time. And I think that's the big difference between doing styling professionally than for Instagram or blogging, that it's a responsibility of, of I mean, it's, it's a big cost to do a photo shoot and, and the image it has, images has to live for a long time. So you both have to, you know, see what the client needs, but also to make sure that it's not too similar. Even, I have a style, but it's, I mean, I can't do Ikea and Orleans and they end up looking the same. It's so, you have to constantly renew yourself. I actually also see a change a little bit in roles that's quite interesting, I think, with uh, the designer. I mean, some of the great designers that we work with, they're not only product designers, they're also stylists and photographers, and, and we actually take them all the way on the journey from mm. the idea is born uh, for a certain product that fulfills a need in the market to the way it's communicated, and I love bringing them into the process. Mm. I think I experienced in many other companies where we work that it's yeah. much more divided. And, and, mm. and, uh, Which is actually a, a really sad thing because then you end up doing briefing the briefer all the time. Exactly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you, then you, you know, you, at the end of the day, you don't have any story left. No. Mm. So That's I think true. that there's a lot of companies, we're also going that route, actually having the designer board all mm. the way through yeah. mm. from the beginning, actually doing the brief for themselves also, exactly. mm. being part of it. We recently opened uh, the other day an exhibition at the Architectural Museum in Stockholm uh, for the Designer of the Year prize that we have with note that Lotta uh, curated. But it's probably the first time that the Architectural Museum get, have a st styling as their main theme, but it was directly discussing these topics about the power of the image and the stylist today and the changing culture in the design industry. So that was really interesting. You should go and visit. <laughs> uh, but <clears throat> when you work with speed as well, as you mentioned earlier, um, isn't it very easy to come up with what you know the market already wants? Uh, I mean, in, in doing the same safe way rather than challenging. I'm thinking of Menu and what you've done there. I think yeah. it's a fantastic collection, but... I, I think it's a quite complex question because mm. I think for us we needed that speed to make a statement in the market that we wanted to change and, and now that we've gone some of the way I, I'm much more inspired by Nathan's way of uh, writing that's about slowing down so now I'm trying to <laughs> go in the complete opposite direction a little bit. No meaning that we've reached a point now where we try to introduce kind of like timeless classic pieces that hopefully have a much longer product life cycle than what the company used to have. They had maybe, they sold a lot of pieces in one year and then it dropped the year after and then you had to reinvent yourself all the time, kind of following the, the pace of fashion and I, I can see that pushing into this industry as well. And I think if you take that thought all the way through, just imagining if you have to, you know, build new houses each, each year because the style changes, mm -hmm. the resource waste that would be. so. I'm really trying to see if we can, you know, make products that can last for a very long time. And then, of course, you'll have to roll a little bit with colors and materials and so on. But it's, um, I think it's good for, for environment, but it's also smarter money, not having to, to use so many res resources redeveloping uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. What's your view on this, Marcus? I think it's the same thing, actually. I, I think also we need to work with long-lasting items. 
But it doesn't mean that you can't have a curious approach on things. Yeah. Us as a big company, we need to be curious mm. all the time, you know, finding new ways. And there you need to work in a mo much more speedier way, actually. Yeah. Uh, and I don't see speed in, in doesn't have to be in, in as a hinder to doing great stuff, no, actually. No, 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 no. Sometimes the, if you have a really speedy creative effort, it turns out better than putting years and years into something. Yeah. It's more how, you, how the team functions. Mm. But I think it's nice if you can look at is, is there a new production method or is there a new function or a new material combination, a new material that kind of allows you to put a new product on the market so mm. it's not just following mm. other people's work or... Uh, and I think that's the way also to be curious and actually create something new that maybe can fulfill it an actual need in a new way. Mm. Uh, if you start a brand today um, or, a, or a new title like you're about to do uh, in, uh, after the summer in August, uh, what, what are the differences compared to when you founded Kinfolk? Can you see different challenges starting out something new today? No, I mean, I think, I think the challenges are I mean, they're similar, yeah. When we launched Kinfolk, the, it was crucial that we recognized a very specific gap, uh, that we could identify it, and that we were honest with ourselves too, that we weren't just tricking ourselves that that was a gap. So it's the same, the same process now. And then also, um, just focus in general has been, it's been an, an ongoing challenge for us. Uh, and it's still, I mean, it still is. So for us to be able to like really focus in on both our target audience, our editorial scope, uh, and even just doing uh, magazines in general and not like going off and doing other things, opening a restaurant, a pizza shop, <laughs> whatever we're tempted by. Um, <laughs> and I think in most of the companies that I see in media that are also doing well, it's, it's because they can in a way put like the horse blinders on and just not be distracted by other categories and industries mm -hmm. and just do something well, like just own it, own something. Mm -hmm. How, uh, Jonas, how do you see um, your line of work changing, both being from a designer and architect perspective and also as a strategist with companies? How can you see this change? I mean, the, the role or the way yeah, we work? Yeah, both or, the design industry <laughs> with the changes. Yeah, as I said before, I, I really experienced that, uh, that lines are blurring in many ways. Uh, when I started uh, architecture school, what is it, 15, 16 years ago, I think uh, I was set out to a business that was very much either way, architects doing kind of like large competitions or you were doing private residential architecture, you were a designer, you are a graphic designer, everything was divided. And I see a lot of the young design studios we work with today all over the world actually. They're, um, they're working within a number of creative disciplines and mm -hmm. then it's more about either a, a way of looking at design, it could be an approach or it's a certain aesthetic, or, but they, they express themselves in many different ways. And I think technology has just made it so much easier to, mm. to do all the things at once. I mean, you don't have to learn the craft in the same way if you have a specific idea, a, spe a specific view on the world. Mm. Um, and then I also see that there's an, another way that lines are blurring a bit where kind of like regional styles are being dissolved at the moment. You see a lot of Scandinavian designers, for example, working for Italian brands. We are meeting with a lot of Italian brands saying we want Scandinavian design. <laughs> and, um, and in Menu, for example, we, we are a Scandinavian brand, but we, we work with designers in Los Angeles, in Taipei, in Portugal, Spain, uh, France, the UK, Germany. I think we have more international designers that are mm -hmm. not Scandinavian than, than Scandinavian. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, in that way, I think that very recognizable regional style is dissolving slowly as well. I also think a lot of the, the new Scandinavian brands you see there may be more Dutch inspired in, mm -hmm. in fact that they're Scandinavian and so on. That's, that's a change that I think we'll experience much more in the future. Yeah. Mm. Isn't that more about like having common values about things than yeah, rather definitely. than living in an area? Exactly, yeah, you find kind of kinfolk all over the globe mm. where you <laughs> in, in, instantly <laughs> <laughs> relate. To, to, yeah. And it's so much more easy with, uh, with social media finding yeah. those people. Mm. I mean, it's, uh, just see a certain image style, a certain aesthetic and and it's so easy to get in contact.
Mm-hmm. It, it, it seems like it's, it's an approach that works. I mean, it works well for menu. Uh, you mentioned like Note Design Studio as well. But then when I think of the, a lot of like the, the heritage Danish brands that like have that, that specific DNA, I'm, I'm curious how that can work for them. I mean, how much innovation is allowed there? Yeah. I mean, there's obviously like an obligation to, to stay to the roots and to keep things consistent. Yeah. But I mean, do you have experience with that? No, I just, I, I know for a long period, I, I think it's changed a lot within the past 10 years, but before that, everybody was complaining, especially in Denmark, that there was no innovation in, in design whatsoever. I mean, we had all the classics from the 50s, 60s, and 17s, but nothing really happened after that. And all the brands were very conservative, and you know they were selling those pieces pretty well. <laughs> I know when I started with Menu, I think, was it 30 or 40 percent of the turnover were, were new products each year that had to mm. kind of uh, be reinvented mm. for a company like Fritz Hansen, it was three percent. Mm. Uh, so it's just it was uh, <laughs> completely different. I, I like seeing a brand like Arctic now that's been very conservative mm. for a long time mm. actually starting to reinvent themselves yeah. a little bit mm. you know, or reimagine. Mm. But but of course, it, I think for some of those brands, it's important also to to stay true to your roots as well. Mm. Yeah, I, mean, I think a lot of the, the success that they've, those brands have had is because they're good at that. They're good at staying yeah. focused. Yeah. If they were willy-nilly and just experimenting too much, then it's hard to recognize yeah, yeah. what the strength yeah. is there. Yeah. But it's kind of a two-way thing, isn't it? When they were introduced, they were like the most in- innovative companies in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. but that's, that's where a lot of these studios will go, though. I mean, yeah. the, the younger guys, it takes, it takes a while to experiment and figure out who you are yeah. as a designer. In 20 years, they'll, need to, they'll, be, they'll be the ones that need to innovate mm-hmm. again. Yeah. Going back to your field, Lotta, um, you mentioned it, it has changed a lot, um, your role. How can you see it change uh, in the future? How do you see your line of work? How will you work in five years' time, for example? And the whole profession, I mean, then. Well, that's a, <laughs> a tricky question. But as I started to say, it's, it's, I think the quality, the, the, the value of the, the image is changing. And... And I'm always trying to aim for cons- consistency, that it's not just about a quick fix. I get a lot of uh, companies that want me to, can you come in, f- just do three images, just do something, we just want to have some buzz ab- around it, and I don't believe in that. It's, I think the best thing is to, you choose someone that you want to work with, you do it for a long period of time, you, you work with consistency, like you do the images, you do the stands at the fairs, you do the styling in the shops. It's like you don't want to see an image and then you go to the store and you're like, oh, is this the place? Or it's, it's all about putting it all together. So I think that's changing. It is, I think a lot of com- companies have panicked the last years because they needed images. Um, and now they kind of s- mm. are slowing down <laughs> and <laughs> looking at what they really need and how, how to deal with that. Mm. But isn't there a, a dilemma between consistency on one side uh, and then you know, being suddenly in a position where a certain style is uh, becoming so mainstream that everybody yeah. is doing monochrome yeah. uh, interior yeah, shots. Is. Or, yeah, I mean, you see images of hands with coffee cups and wooden tables <laughs> yeah. taken from above <laughs> <laughs> all over the place suddenly. I mean, yeah. it, how do you move from there? Uh, but that's I don't know, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> but that is the key in the yeah. styling profession to, to move away from that, to not keep doing what you have been doing and also to help the clients, because they are kind of anxious. You know, if we sit down and we look at, this is what we're doing this year, we're doing these fairs, we're doing these colors, and then there's a trend forecaster screaming like, hey, it's plastic fantastic, we're doing pink now, and and the clients are like, we have to do pink. So it's a part of, you know, you have to develop, but you have to stay true to to the DNA of the company too, so. But I mean, if you work as a stylist, I would be bored if I kept doing the same thing. Yeah. So it's also, when the clients come, most of the time they have an image, like this is what we want. And that helps me to understand what they want. But then it's my job to help them to develop that yeah. into something new, because otherwise we're just copying what someone else did. Mm. And I mean, if they're just, yeah, if they're just pulling an image from yeah. someone else's brand, then yeah. that's, 
that's a problematic starting point. It is. Yeah. It it's, is. It, it seems like it's it's fundamental that there's something deeper that there's mm -hmm. actually like core objectives, core values that come from the company, and then they pass those along to you and ask you to interpret those and express them. But if there's no yeah, if there's no values that they can yeah. express, then it is one season going to look like this company, the next season's going to look like that magazine. Yeah. It's it's not sustainable. So we brought up a few different uh, topics that are important when you when you to reach success in a company. But if you're going to summarize it, if 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 someone came to you and wanted to start a company and wanted some advice, uh, what what advice would you give, uh, Jonas? I think uh, there are two really important things. One is that you really need to stay true to your own passion in many ways. I mean. As you said before, try not to look too much at uh, anybody else, and then just keep on doing what you really feel passionate about. I can see it go, it go, goes wrong every time you start looking too much at demands or things in, in the market. Of course, this is really good design, and you need to analyze society and understand what are the needs, and then come up with a good solution. But don't look too much uh, into other people's work. And, and then, as I said initially, I think having this very strong connection in your value chain where there are no disruptions uh, is also really a key to, to success. Having to reinvent something over the past three years, I, we've had a lot of you know, things that were not aligned and it was a big problem each time and as soon as something fell into place, suddenly you know, mm. it was just taking off. So, uh, mm. And how would you summarize that, Marcus? Summarize that or something No, else? <laughs> the same question. Uh, I would say that it's um, a little bit to your note to say that an end-to-end -end approach all the way through to have the same kind of people working with it all the way through. Then there is something about transparency also. I think that the, this industry has you know, been into uh, keeping things very tight all the time by themselves. But I see also the way that things are moving that the more transparent you are with your ideas from the very beginning, the better they will become because mm. more people are, you know, could give you input. So mm. I think that's part of it. Um, then there is something about the, the culture of, of this, this bottom-up approach. If you have the bottom-up approach, you also have to be allowing when it comes mm. to mistakes. Mm. And for us as a company, one of the things or the success stories of IKEA is actually that we've been maybe the best company in the world of making mistakes. <laughs> uh, and uh, that's, that's the actual success, and mm. we have learned from them, and we learn really fast. Mm. So from out of those, all of those mistakes, we make great things. And that's also mm. kind of a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. How would you summarize? Uh, yeah? <laughs> I'd, I'd go with the clarity of purpose. So Say again? Clarity of purpose. Yeah. So when, when starting a new project, when launching a business, whether it's design, styling, publishing, really being able to articulate why you're doing it. Mm. I mean, I think that's, that's a core value at, mm. at Norm is with each product, I mean, why? Why are we designing it? Why are we putting it into the market? Why do customers buy it? And why are they going to want to keep it? Um, it should be the same with any business. And that should be something that's so clear that we can just you can spit it off to anyone. Mm. What would you say, Lotta? Mm -hmm. When you look at the companies from the outside, mm -hmm. do you sometimes feel you want to go in and give them advice of what to do? That All the time. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can't really give, give up advice. I'm not a designer, but from a stylist point of view, my advice is to stay true to what you're good at. I mean, just because you have a blog, you don't have to be a photographer. Just because you have an Instagram account, you don't have to be a stylist. You have to find, find what you're good at and stay true to that profession, you don't have to be good at everything, everything mm. because I think that's, that's the key to, you know, to find quality in what we're doing. Mm. Do you think there will be a backlash? I mean, today you see the stylists working with design companies. Mm. I mean, we see the, it broadens a lot. Do you think there will be a backlash to that? Yeah, it might be. I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining the panel today and thank you so much to the audience. I hope you could hear us well. Um, I, if you want to ask any questions, is it anyone in the audience who wants to ask a question? Normally in Scandinavia we don't get so many questions, but um, you can all come and, and um, ask privately after the talk. Thank you so much. <laughs>